On September the 13th, 1983, a brutal murder took place. The charges against Juan were first degree murder and armed robbery. In five days, he was convicted and sentenced to death. Juan Melendez spent 17 years, eight months, and one day on death row in a six by nine foot prison cell. Estados Unidos está con Afganistán, Pakistán, Morocco, Mongolia, Malasia, China. Esas son la gente que aplica la pena de muerte. Esa sería la súplica que usted está haciendo al jurado. En este Le estoy momento. haciendo esa súplica, que no me maten a mi único hijo. Yo no tengo más hijos, es mi único hijo. ¿Tienes fe en el proceso y en la justicia? Esperamos sí, yo siempre he tenido fe en el proceso y en la justicia. Que en el futuro los federales mantengan su marcha de muerte colonial fuera de Puerto Rico. Claro que sí. Nuestro compromiso es al sistema, al proceso. La ley provee que en ciertos casos una pena de muerte se justifica y en esos casos nosotros vamos a llevar esto hasta sus últimas consecuencias. La pena de muerte no ha prosperado en Puerto Rico y yo espero que nunca prospere. Parece que la idiosincrasia del puertorriqueño se mantiene en creer en la vida. La Constitución de Puerto Rico claramente prohíbe la pena de muerte. No solamente se reconoce el derecho a la vida y a la seguridad de todas las personas, pero va más allá y explícitamente aparece en nuestra Constitución una prohibición a la pena de muerte en Puerto Rico. La hora cero ha llegado para el convicto Ángel Nieves Díaz, quien será ejecutado mañana miércoles. La coalición puertorriqueña contra la pena de muerte estará allí dándole solidaridad a esa familia que tanto merece y haremos las gestiones para lograr que ese objetivo, ese sueño, esa última voluntad de Ángel Nieves esté presente en el momento de su entierro. La coalición contra la pena de muerte en Puerto Rico es la agrupación, la suma de la fuerza de los individuos y demás organizaciones abolicionistas que en Puerto Rico nos oponemos a la pena de muerte que se nos ha traído a través de la Corte Federal. Efectivamente hoy ha sido un día muy difícil para un periodista tener que entrevistar a un reo que se encuentra a menos de 24 horas para ser ejecutado por inyección letal. Y nos preocupa de manera particular la ejecución de puertorriqueños en los Estados Unidos. Pero su familia todavía espera un milagro y no quieren que se haga historia de Ángel Nieves Díaz como el primer boricua ejecutado en el estado de la Florida. Sí, he recibido una anotación de que el Tribunal Supremo de los Estados Unidos eh, denegó la petición, es decir, que ya es inminente la, la ejecución. Una hora después, el Departamento de Corrección de la Florida efectuó una conferencia de prensa donde dejó saber que Ángel Nieves Díaz tardó 36 minutos en morirse, considerando esto así como una ejecución inusual. La pena de muerte es un castigo cruel que provoca dolor, sufrimiento, agonía y tortura en la persona que la recibe. Pero no solamente en la persona que la recibe, sino también en sus familiares. La pena de muerte es un acto de venganza. Y en el proceso de sanación nuestro, en el proceso de sanación de las víctimas, no, no ayuda a infligir dolor a otro para uno poder sanar. My opposition to the death penalty arises from the fact that it's a government program. It really is a government program. It's no different than any other government program. And many people understand that when you've got a government program, mistakes are made. I don't believe the death penalty can ever be sufficiently reformed to eliminate all errors. So unless you're going to say that, um, you know, it's acceptable to make a couple of mistakes in order to execute um, many guilty people. El caso de Juan Meléndez dramatiza, demuestra claramente que la pena de muerte está reservado para los pobres, para los grupos minoritarios y que se impone de manera caprichosa 
aún en relación con personas que son inocentes. Juan Roberto Meléndez es un puertorriqueño que pasó 17 años, 8 meses y un día en el corredor de la muerte del estado de Florida por un crimen que no cometió. As an exoneree, as someone who has been released and exonerated from death row, he was considered a very, very important voice in the movement against the death penalty. Along with the 98 other exonerees from death row, he was the number 99th. If we don't trust the government to figure out how best to handle our tax money um, or how to spend our tax money, how can we trust the government to determine who to kill and who not to kill? I think the death penalty is fatally flawed because we can never eliminate all of the errors from the system and there's always going to be a risk of innocent people being executed. That's really sort of the ultimate thing that the government can do is to kill you, to put you to death. Nací en el barrio de Guardajaya de Patillas. Soy de Maunapo. Sí, mi nombre es Andrea Colón. Ah, eso fue cuando yo fui a verlo allá bendito. Mira qué jovencita estoy yo ahí, joven a él. Eso me hace más años. <risa> Tengo como unas libras menos, ¿verdad? <risa> Y él también, un muchacho. ¿Te fijas? Un muchacho. Eso fue cuando yo fui a ver por primera vez. Juan Roberto Meléndez Colón. Nací en Brooklyn, New York. Él lo pusieron en el certificado de nacimiento John Robert, Robert Meléndez. Pero el nombre era Juan Roberto Meléndez. Pero como en ese tiempo no, no había mucho hispano en la... En eso, pues... Cuando se apuntó, lo apuntaban en la misma hospital. Pues le, le pusieron el nombre en inglés. Después de, para cortárselo, pues le pusimos ya. Nos lleva a Estados Unidos, a todo, como a toda la pobreza y la, la el ambiente por allá. Bastante fuerte, porque en aquella época se, 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 se trabajaba mucho y se ganaba poco. I'm not a killer. My mama did not raise no killers. Yo no creía criminales. Ninguno de mis hijos son criminales. Yo no creía criminales. Yo ni se crió en la iglesia. Él, él, él cogió catecismo. Él iba a la misa. Iban a pies. Ellos, ellos dos que estaban conmigo, iban a pies. se empeñó en irse a trabajar para los campos en Estados Unidos, pero antes de eso era muy buen estudiante, siempre era de cuatro puntos. Y no quiso seguir y se fue para los Estados Unidos eh, de migrante, eh, trabajando en los, los campos. Y así se fue desapareciendo hasta que eh, tuvo sus problemas. Él pasó sus problemas sin yo saberlo. Después de que él estaba, había, había años que estaba en esa cárcel, después me escribió, yo no sabía de él, tuvo mucho tiempo sin yo saber de él. September the 13th, 1983, a brutal murder took place. And the victim was the owner of the beauty salon. His name was Delbert Baker. He was known as Mr. Dell to his friends and his acquaintances. He was shot three times in the head and in the shoulder area. 
and he had his throat slashed. The crime scene was drenched in blood. And a period of time goes by where the police can't figure it out. But then this person shows up in town, and he knows Juan and comes to not like Juan and has a grudge against Juan and starts telling the police this story that Juan has confessed to having committed this murder. And so um, then they uh, find Juan up in Pennsylvania, I believe it was in March of 84, and then bring him back down to Florida for this trial. They took me to court in front of a judge, and he was talking about extradition. At that time, I didn't know what extradition mean because I was not, did not know the language that well. He was reading the charges to me. So this public defender, I remember him packing me in the back, and, and I can't hardly understand what he's saying because I did not know English that well. And I was naive to the law. But he used to tell me, eh, don't worry about it, you, you will go home. That part I didn't understand. I should go home. I didn't commit the crime. September the 17th, 1984. On the Monday, they picked the jury. They selected the jury. They continued selecting the jury on Tuesday. I, I handled a case, a trial in New York City, in a capital case. We took two months to pick the jury. The trial lasted for three months. There is a very rigorous process whereby only what we call in the law, death qualified jurors may sit in a death penalty case. That means you can only sit in a death penalty case if you can swear, you can take an oath that you can either impose a sentence of death on another human being or you can consider imposing death on another human being. So many Hispanics, many African Americans were struck from this jury, as is often the case in death penalty cases, because of their opposition to the death penalty. I can tell you, in other places, they would be shocked at how fast and short this trial was. But even by Florida standards, it was fast and short. We have 11 whites and one African American. The evidence comes in on Wednesday. Juan had long hair. Uh, it's been described as a bit sort of like an afro. It was very fuzzy and it was, and it was long. And he refused to cut it. The evidence that put him on death row was very, very weak. The whole case, the state's case, rested almost entirely on the testimony of two witnesses. We have a police informant with an unsavory criminal history who also receives, according to several individuals, who received $5,000 for his testimony against Juan at trial. And then we have John Berrien, who is a friend of Juan Melendez's, who testifies under the threat of the electric chair. One of the people advocating to convict him uh, pointed to this photograph of Juan that had been introduced into evidence uh, with his afro. And he and apparently said to the other jurors, look at that afro. It's as big as a quarter. And was using that to justify convicting him of a murder. What does it have to do with whether or not he committed the murder? All it has it to do with is the racism um, that was going on in the jury room. So on Thursday, the jury convicts Juan. On Friday, the very next day, the jury sentenced Juan to death. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the same week. They sent me to death. And the judge complained that it was all taking too long. Certainly his profile, certainly his background, certainly his socioeconomic status, certainly Puerto Rican, dark-skinned. On some level, it's like Casablanca, round up the usual suspects. If you go and you, you know, close this book, pin this murder on somebody nobody's going to care about, you can do it. Everybody's happy. arriving there in the winter on a Tuesday, November the 2nd, 1984. I got shackles on my legs, chains in my waist, and handcuffs on my wrists. The place was 
horrified. It was dark, it was cold. Friends, I did not know nobody in there. I was alone. I got real scared, because the thoughts in my mind was uh, they killing people here every week. How long is going, it's going to be for them to get me? And I tied the, the bar doors. So when the guy did, was doing his counting, Melendez, why you got that damn doors tied up? So me and this correction office, we, uh, we just arguing, cursing each other out. I know they're killing people here every week, and we ain't doing nothing. And then the rest of the condemned men to death, they, they got involved in the argument. But to my surprise, uh, it was against me. They told me that I was wrong, that I was crazy, that I was a fool, that all I do is get up in the morning and and curse and nag and cry about my innocence. They told me that I, that I did not know how to read. I did not know how to write. And I did not know how to speak English. Then they told me the most beautiful thing I could hear at that time. They told me they would teach me. The worst of the worst, if they never taught me, I would never have survived that place. Yo vine a saber de este de ese problema, este porque después de que estaba había años que estaba en esa cárcel, después me escribió. Yo no sabía de él. Tuvo mucho tiempo sin yo saber de él. Porque en la finca siempre me escribía y estaba pendiente y venían y iban y venían y iban, pero cuando se me desapareció, que estuvo muchos años sin escribirme, cuando me escribió, fue para decirme dónde estaba. I had a friend of mine, an African American friend of mine, that was supposed to allegedly kill the police. He was next door to me. His name is Leo Jones. He was a security. In 1996, we, we, me and him always was talking about family, and and I told him, I said, man, I, I just don't have the nerve to tell my mama this. I don't know if she can have a heart attack or something like that. And he told me, he said, man, you better write it. You better find a way. You're going to need her. She can help you. En cuanto yo lo supe que estaba allá, lo fuimos a ver, fuimos. Más que yo le conté a mi familia, pues todos ellos seguidos empezaron a escribirle y siempre los teníamos a tanto de todos los acontecimientos que pasaban por acá, que nunca los abandonamos. Para mi familia siempre le mandábamos su dinerito para que tuviera sus cosas y cuando muchachito nacía de los hermanos o de la, de la familia, se le mandaban sus estratos. Bautismo, íbamos a la playa y nos retratamos, le mandábamos para que nos viera. Cómo los sobrinos iban creciendo, yo los conocía a, 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 con retra, de retrato. Entonces, él tiene su álbum de todo, todos ellos, según iban. De eso. Siempre estaba, nunca lo olvidamos. ¿no? Tú sabes, lo sacamos de, de, del núcleo familiar, que le compartíamos con él nuestras emociones, lo, todo lo que pasaba por acá. Tristeza y alegría. Y él me lo dijo, mami, yo soy inocente. Fue un calvario. I used to clean the cell when I was depressed. And it worked for me. And, and I learned that when you're depressed, they, the key is to get out, of, get out of that stage. Don't stay in it. Stay in it, because if you stay in it, it's going to get you.
1998, um, the Florida Supreme Court denied uh, unreasonably uh, a new trial. There was an attorney who had been representing um, John Varian, a witness against Juan, who had talked to Vernon James, and Vernon James had told him he committed the murder. This attorney testified, oh yes, Vernon James told me I committed the murder. Um, he testified, this was like in 96, so it was like 12 years later. Um, and, the, and the Florida Supreme Court said, oh, well, it's a vague memory. Uh, you know, we, we can't rely on that, and brushed it aside. I also, at one point in time, had represented an individual named Frank Lee Smith, who was on death row. His case was out of Fort Lauderdale. I remember Frank always, always claiming his innocence. I remember him, he was getting sick. He had cancer. And the word was, they put, took him to the hospital. The word was that every time the lawyer come to see him, he was crying for the DNA test. The state was fighting it, wouldn't agree to it. Um, then Frank died of cancer. And uh, Barry Sheck with the Innocence Project came in and managed to get the state to agree finally to do the DNA testing. Unfortunately, he died of cancer before the DNA test was resolved. And when the DNA test result came, it came indicating that he didn't commit the crime. The case was ready to go into federal court, and the attorney who had been handling it, Gail Anderson, a very good friend of mine, um, was very disheartened over how nobody was listening. When I saw her, I noticed that she was, had tears. She said, I'm sorry, I, can, I cannot handle your case no more. Oh, no, don't say that. You know my case better than anybody. I don't need no more, I don't need no new lawyer in, in, in this stage of the case. She, she couldn't do it anymore, and she had to give the case to somebody else because she was so frustrated, and she was afraid that she was missing something, and she needed to have fresh eyes look at it. And I say, why? You don't want to represent me no more. Do you know why? I lost five clients. And don't mistake what I'm saying. This, when she says she lost five clients, it's five clients that got killed, got murdered by the state, executed. And she say, they are your friends. And I just dropped my head. And I only stood right in there the, that she couldn't, this couldn't handle no more. It was too much for her. You in conversations with so long, till next time, keep the faith, or you know, I mean, all, all these phrases that always assume there's another day coming. And, and saying goodbye to somebody uh, who is now going to go be killed until you've experienced that, you just can't imagine what that's like. And the worst was in 1998, when I had to tell Leo um, that it was over. Leo, I'm convinced, was innocent. Uh, there was as much evidence of innocence in his case, almost as much as in Juan's case. Um, I know he was innocent. And in having to tell him, actually, uh, I had my last conversation with him, we, we hadn't received the final denial. Um, but I, know, I knew he was meeting with his family, and I just wanted to get word to him. And I, I wanted to tell him, and I told him, just assume it's over. If there's anything that can be done, I'll do it. Just assume it's over, and, and make your peace with your family. And that conversation really was one of the hardest conversations I ever had. And what was so cruel about what they did to Leo is um, it was the electric chair, and the electric chair had malfunctioned. Leo had been scheduled for execution, 
in March of 97, and uh, I represented Pedro Medina, who, uh, when they put him in the electric chair, caught fire. Uh, and uh, it made national news, it was a big deal, and Leo was scheduled to be next. And so I ended up having to litigate whether or not there was a problem with the electric chair in Leo's case. But I also was trying to establish his innocence. And the judge made Leo attend these hearings that were experts discussing what it was like to be in the electric chair and whether or not he was going to feel pain. And the judge made him sit in the courtroom for all of that. That was cruel. Um, and, uh, and then to lose the case and then to have him electrocuted. It took a while to recover from that. The hardest thing for me was when they had to kill somebody. All we did was we kept in silence. You see, I'm, I'm in this cell. Next to me is another man condemned to death. That I've been knowing him for about 10, 15 years. He cries in my shoulder. I cries in his. He tell me the most deeper thoughts. I tell him mine. I learned to grow to love him. And then one day they snatch him out of that cell. And I know what's gonna happen. They're gonna kill him. And I cannot stop it. I know the exact time, the precise time when they they burn the life out of him. Because the lights go on and off. And I, can, I cannot still stop it. People think that they're killing a monster, but they're not. They're not killing the same person that committed the crime. They're killing somebody else. They're killing a human being. Some of them are innocent, like Jesse Tefaro, Benny Dents. Leo Jones and Pedro Medina. And all I can say is, I'll see you soon. Pero nadie en el barrio lo sabía porque yo no se lo conté a nadie, solamente a Dios y a la Virgen Santísima. Y ahí se pegué yo a pedir a, pedir a Santísima, así tuve todos esos años. Tres rosarios. Porque eso es lo que mandaba a ella que se le rezaran tres rosarios. Y yo, eso, uno en la aurora, otro como a las nueve y otro a las tres de la tarde. Bueno, yo no le dije a nadie que yo tenía un hijo que lo iban a matar en la silla eléctrica, como ya en ese tiempo era la silla eléctrica. Todavía las amigas mías, mis compañeras de trabajo me dicen, pero muchacha, ¿cómo tú pasaste todo ese tiempo con nosotras y nunca nos dijiste nada? Nadie me iba a creer que era inocente. Porque usted sabe cómo somos nosotros los humanos, pues yo también me, me, me incluyo. Y dicen, ay, si está en la cárcel, pues Dios sabe todo lo que hizo, porque, porque así es la vida. Y yo no las culpo porque pues, a la, yo sabía que me iba a creer a la que le, pedí, le, le decía que era la Santísima Virgen y al Santísimo a su hijo, que eran los que me podían ayudar, porque nadie me iba a ayudar por acá. Y ellas, ellas siempre me reprochan eso de que yo no le dije nada. Y la familia mía también, todo el mundo se quedó calladito, todo el mundo escribía y estaban de eso, pero nadie comentaba. Yes, I have so Plenty of my friends commit suicide. But it's one particular that affected me a lot. 
There was a friend of mine named, named Samuel Rivera from Ponce, Puerto Rico. I never can see a uh, thing committing suicide, but I see when the body, when they wheel the body out. I had a mirror in, my, in myself, and something in my head tells me, hey, you're not gonna look at your friend for the last time. So I take the mirror and I stretch my arms to the bar, and I look, I see a purple blue face that do not look like my friend. Dentro de, de mí se veía la tristeza. Porque es que nunca me lo quitaba de la mente. Suena el teléfono, uno cree que, que son malas noticias que vienen. Cuando uno tiene una, esa, esa pendencia, no, ni puedo dormir tranquilo. Son muchas noches las que se pasan en vela uno pensando. Yo se lo pedía al Señor, yo le decía, Señor, tú sabes si eres inocente, yo no lo sé. Para mí es inocente, pero tú sí lo sabes de seguridad, que él es inocente. Y le pedí a la Virgen Santísima, tú también, entregaste tu hijo inocentemente, lo, lo iniciaron ahí inocentemente, pasaste por el mismo calvario que yo. Como madre que tú fuiste, ayúdame. Y ayuda a todas esas madres que también tienen, están pasando por el mismo calvario. Hasta que la Virgen me hizo el milagro de devolverme mi hijo. A 50-year-old former fruit picker from Puerto Rico is a free man. Why Juan ultimately gets exonerated is this really bizarre thing. As a matter of luck, a matter of luck. The transcript of the taped interview of Vernon James that had been done in 1984 was found. This trial investigator meets with the defense attorney at trial, Roger Alcott, and they meet for lunch. And over lunch, they discuss the case and they discuss evidence. And the trial defense attorney, who actually at that point had become a judge, he says, I think I remember seeing a box with the name Melendez on it. So the two of them went to look in the storage area they looked in the file, which had the name Melendez on it, and they found a transcript of a tape confession of the real killer. He had this. He had a tape of this guy saying he was there. The jury never heard it. What happens is, is that the defense attorney, for some unknown reason, perhaps he thought it violated some legal rule, the hearsay rule, but for some unknown reason, he did not even attempt to introduce that transcript into evidence at trial. That mistake proved almost fatal. Prosecutors get rewarded for death sentences. The prosecutor decided to go ahead to trial even though he had information that Juan Melendez was an innocent man because he did not receive that information until after Juan had been indicted. And what jurors really don't 
realize and what the public really doesn't recognize is the politics, the politics of the local community. Prosecutors run for election in Florida. Judges run for election. And so there is an interest politically for uh, prosecutors to get convictions and for judges to impose sentences of death. All those years of appeals and he never disclosed these statements of individuals to whom the real killer had confessed. He never disclosed that information to the defense attorney, which he had an ongoing duty to do under the law. It was about winning. It was about retaining his win. It was no longer about justice. Pero ya yo, yo, yo creo que yo sabía antes que él saberlo, yo sabía que él iba a salir. Porque ya de allá me habían avisado los abogados del, un abogado que se llama Rodríguez, que es hispano, que trabaja con los abogados de él, me había llamado y me había dicho que, que era el último juicio, la última apelación, porque él siempre me, me decía, y si en esa, esa apelación se, se lograba, ya ni salía dentro de dos semanas. And another lucky thing happened. The case got moved out of Polk County. And I always think that it's better to have a judge from another county here in the case, because that judge doesn't have to stand for election with the voters of Polk County. She's in Hillsborough County. And she actually looked at the case, considered the case, and did the right thing. As Mike Vassalendo reports, Juan Melendez was ordered released after a judge found fundamental errors in his initial trial. And this was days before Christmas. We knew, because the prosecutor scheduled a hearing in Polk County for late in January, like three or four weeks later, um, at which time that's when it would be announced. And it really irritated me. <laughs> it's like, what's, what's the delay? If you're gonna be releasing him, why does he have to spend another month on death row? Um, and I tipped off a newspaper reporter and one thing led to another and within 48 hours he was released. Attorneys won't comment about the possibility of a lawsuit, but Juan Melendez himself says there's no amount of money that could possibly compensate him for his lost years. It caught me totally by surprise. Melendez, you do not understand what's going on here, do you? We're facing your paperwork. They're going to release you today. I was happy, but part of me still was sad because I leave them behind. So now I'm going to say goodbye to my friend in the next to the last cell. I want to say goodbye to him, but I cannot speak. I'm happy. I got a smile on my face and tears that's running down, but part of me that's still sad because I got to leave them behind, and I know their destiny. If we don't get the death penalty abolished, they're gonna kill them all. His friend says, was crying, but he was able to tell me, don't forget about us. Don't get into no trouble out there. Take care of yourself. And the last thing he told me was, take care of your mama. Then I get to the door that's gonna let me out of that wing. And before they open the door, I hear one clap. I hear the second clap, I hear the third clap, and I heard a whole bunch of claps. The entire death row facility was clapping their hands. They were clapping so loud the guards got mad at them and told them to be quiet, but they didn't stop clapping until I left the place. On a cold January night, Juan Melendez became a free man. The 50-year-old Melendez was convicted of killing a cosmetology school owner back in 1983. That sentence was upheld by the state Supreme Court, but a transcript of another man's confession was discovered two years ago. Defense attorneys say Vernon James, now deceased, confessed to at least four investigators to the crime, but none of the admissions was admitted as evidence. A judge ordered a new trial. The prosecutors decided they didn't have enough evidence because one of the two witnesses against Melendez recanted and the other is dead. Through all that, Melendez kept his faith. Do, do you think that's a miracle? That Juan was not executed? 
I think Juan considers it a miracle. I tend to um, characterize it as an incredible quirk of fate that he was not executed. Had Juan been on death row in Texas or in Virginia, he would not be alive today. Y yo en ese tiempo no tenía la virgencita. Yo le rezaba la virgencita con una estampillita que me habían dado. Y yo con a esa estampillita yo le rezaba. Entonces, la vecina mía sí tenía la virgencita. Y yo le dije, mira, coge estas dos rosas y pónselas a la virgen. Pónselas en mi nombre, porque ella sabe por qué y dale las gracias. Colón desde su natal Maunabo hasta el aeropuerto, acompañada por amigos y familiares. La sexagenaria, quien durante 18 años se mantuvo firme y depositó toda su fe en un milagro, no podía disimular su emoción. Now I'm able to go home and take care of my mom in Puerto Rico. She's 73 years old, all by herself in the house. And now I can spend some time with her and the rest of the family. So I left the island in 1970. And I've been, I've been back since. Oportunidades de dialogar con él anoche. ¿Qué pasó? ¿Qué dijo? No, no habló mucho. Me dijo que llegaba, que qué sé yo, que yo estuviera aquí en la pelea esperándolo. Muy emocionada. Muy emocionada. Ya está muy contento de llegar a su patria, su verdadera patria, Puerto Rico. Luego de varias horas de espera, el gran momento llegó. Madre e hijo se confundieron en un abrazo. Estadística disponible demuestra que no existe una correlación entre la existencia de la pena de muerte o el número de ejecuciones y las incidencias de violencia y sobre todo crímenes violentos en los estados. En aquellos estados donde existe pena de muerte, los incidentes y los, los indicadores de violencia son altísimos. Other countries have gone through the same process of public debate over well, whether it's good public policy or not. Es muchísimo más fácil mantener una persona encarcelada por el resto de la vida que ejecutarla. Ultimately, for most other Western industrialized countries, they've all come to the same conclusion, and that is that it's poor public policy, it doesn't work, and too many mistakes are made. Some may draw the conclusion that Juan's story is a story that could happen to any of us. And I don't think that's quite correct. Juan's story is the story of what can happen to anybody from the wrong socioeconomic background. Por el hecho de que no ha podido disfrutar, se le han negado unos derechos fundamentales y que esa cadena ¿no? de negación, de transnegación, puede llevar a una persona a confrontar una pena de muerte. It's going to happen to people who are viewed as throwaways, people who are viewed as something less, people who are struggling, people who nobody will care about. Juan's story is remarkable not only because of the exoneration, but because of how he's managed to cope afterwards. Um, with just a hundred dollars and some clothes, how he's managed to make a life for himself, a productive life. Somehow managed to avoid the bitterness and managed to like stay focused on trying to take this negative and turn it into a positive. And I don't know how they did it. I don't know how Juan did it. I think it's so remarkable, and I'm so proud of him. I 
I got to go back to a place that, I, that I'm trying to forget. But I know I cannot forget it. I don't want to be there. But I, I know I have to tell it. It's for good. I left a lot of friends behind, and they're killing them. I just got to do it. I have no choice.